Hey guys, welcome back for uh, part two this week. Uh, usual uh, usual names in the chat room. Uh, evening, everyone. Good to see you again. Um, I've got um, got a new microphone, um, so I can I can wander around now and uh, and warble on. Uh, I've got uh, I've just finished teaching uh, this week. Finished a, uh, a live streaming of the rock tape taping course. So uh, um, yeah, I needed to get a mic so that I can just wander around and do do everything. So uh, yeah, trying it out tonight. So hopefully you can hear me. Hopefully it's all working okay. Um, because everyone's um, been on here before, I'm going to skip the uh, skip the intros. But uh, just to let you know uh, that we are doing the uh, taping course again. Uh, so it's going to be in June, and we're also going to do a rock pods uh, stream as well. So I'm going to show you how to use the uh, the cupping um, pods. And um, with those, what we're doing is uh, we're going to put together a, a patient package. So you guys as therapists can give the codes to your, um, to your patients. Then they can buy their own kit and then you can show them how to treat themselves. So it's a way of their, um, getting some interaction with your patients again. So uh, um, obviously with the tape, it's a little bit more difficult, although there are lots of things you can do yourself with the tape as well. Uh, the pods lends itself quite nicely, especially to the legs and, and the arms um, in terms of self-treatment. So uh, that's coming in June. So I've popped the, uh, I've popped the link in uh, if you want any more information on that. The, um, the taping course is up at the moment, but I don't think the pods has been has been launched yet. So just to let you know about that. Um, so we're going to um, move on to second uh, stage of our uh, case history today. Going to give you uh, a little bit of a uh, little bit of homework to do for Friday. We'll see how you guys get on, and we'll also uh, we'll also go through some of the uh, some of the key clinical conditions that we think this guy might have. So I'm going to give you a few few more clues uh, to uh, solving the puzzles today. So. Uh, first appointment, as usual, going through that sieve. So we've um, we've listened to the information, and now we're going to delve into it in a bit more detail and and highlight the uh, the key areas from it. So second session today, going to have a look at objective assessment and planning. So we're going to have a uh, an idea about what might be going on with this individual, and then from that that thinking, we're then going to work out a an assessment strategy. Uh, picking out the the key things first, so life threatening things first, then life changing things, and then just kind of normal musculoskeletal stuff. So that's kind of order that we would uh, we would see things in, and that's that's the kind of thing that you need to go through in your mind. So is anything that they're presenting with life threatening, and if it is, then we need to refer straight away. If it's life changing, then it will be something that you would either refer to another clinician or a GP or, or whoever. Um, if both of those are ticked off and, and it's less likely to be those things, then it's something that we can deal with and it's a usual musculoskeletal problem. Um, I was delivering a spine workshop over the weekend as well. So I've been quite busy teaching online and uh, we were talking about the prevalence of these kind of conditions. So, um, I mean, it was it was geared towards lower back pain, but uh, uh, 97% of people who have lower back pain who come in, uh, they have uh, it, it usual kind of idiopathic or um, normal aging changes. Okay, so what would on an MRI be called degenerative changes. Uh, so 97% uh, of people that come in are, are normal and have, and have um, just usual kind of aches and pains. It's that 3% that um, are uh, the kind of dodgy ones, okay, that, that may be something like this. Um, so just to put it into context, the kind of case studies that we've been looking at, that's the kind of numbers that you're looking at. So if you see 100 lower back pain patients, three of those may have something seriously wrong with them. Okay, so uh, uh, that that's the kind of thinking, because obviously these are quite extreme cases. So uh, it looks as if there's loads of stuff going on, uh, but that that's obviously the, the purpose of the of the assessment. But um, yeah, usually these kind of things are, are, are very few and far between. So you might you might come across maybe, I don't know, one every 18 months, you, you know, depending obviously on the volume of 
of uh, patients that you see. So just to put it into a bit of a uh, bit of context and not to worry you that every every person coming in has got something uh, um, life altering wrong with them. Uh, so we've got a neck pain scenario uh, with our Mr. W. Uh, he's a mechanic. And uh, so we're go we're going to go through uh, the key bits of his case history uh, this evening. So you can use the sieve to help you. And uh, just see, that should be in my files here. Yep, so if you've not had that before, uh, there you go. Just shared that with you there so you can download that and uh, and use it to help you work out uh, what's going in uh, going on with this individual. Um, oh, not sure what was supposed to be there. Ah, oh, never mind. I can't remember that. Okay, so key things on the on this slide then. So he, um, for a change, our case study is happily married. They're usually divorced or uh, someone's died. Uh, so that this is uh, this is quite a nice one. Uh, he's got three grown up kids and five grandchildren. Okay, so uh, uh, gives us a, a few clues um, about. If I just go back a sec. So if we have a look at the uh, kind of psychosocial elements. So this box here. Yeah, if you're going to fill that box in, then that information will go in there. So we want good things in there as well as the negative things, because um, we can we can use those good things to to help us uh, put his plan together. So if he's got a supportive home environment and we need him to do some uh, some exercises or something like that, then it's going to be easier than if he was um, you know sort of d and divorced and always down the pub. So uh, we've got um, we we can use those elements of his social life to uh, to help us help him okay so uh yeah we've got uh, something positive for once uh right so uh yeah he, he and he also gave up smoking which is really good um and um uh but there's a reason why he gave up smoking which you'll uh, you'll find out for a sec so t uh, two years ago he was uh, diagnosed with hypertension uh so uh, high blood pressure and he was pres uh, prescribed a tenolol so uh, again, if you guys want to have a look at what that is, I'm, I'm going to cover it on Friday. But if you want to have a look beforehand, uh, have a look at what a tenolol is and what and what it uh, what it does. Um, so those were the key bits from that one. And then we've got here. Uh, he is uh, or he was a heavy smoker, um, and he gave up about four years ago. So that's good news. And uh, he, after tests with the consultant, he had moderate emphysema. So we put emphysema down uh, in the viscera box of the of the sieve. OK, um, but he he did feel depressed and guilty about that. Uh, cool. Well done, Natalie. Really good. Uh, yeah. So he did, um, felt depressed and uh, guilty about uh, uh, about that diagnosis because he obviously he brought it on himself um, with with his smoking. So, uh, well, it's a, um, obviously a, a big part of it. So uh, that, may, that will go in the psychosocial bit because then he's got this uh, kind of um, battle with with himself about his health as well. So that's something just to just to be aware of. Um, cool. So I just wanted to um, have a look at this a sec. Bear with me a second. Let's just get this loaded up. Uh, so we're just going to do a little bit of an anatomy recap. Just get that going. Here we go. Okay, right then. So if we zoom into the neck area, so if we come in, come into here, uh, so j just some of the things to uh, to be aware of. So uh, let's just add some layers on, and in particular this one. So we've got an arterial layer here. Okay. Um, do you have a copy of the sieve that can be typed on to kind of edit and print? Um, yeah, Namir. Uh, if you email me, Namir, I'll send you. I'll send you a word version of it. Okay. Um, no, no problem. Just, just let me know. Uh, yeah. So, um, artery-wise, if we have a look at the arteries coming up into the neck, so there, there's his heart down there beating away, and then uh, we've got these main arteries coming off of the uh, of the aortic branch. So we've got a subclavian artery. Uh, that then turns into the axillary artery and then into the uh, brachial artery. So uh, that will supply your arm. But this one here, we've got one that goes up up into the neck, so the uh, carotid artery, and then that turns into two um, different arteries. So you've got your external and internal carotid arteries just there. So that, that's usually the one that you feel um, for, uh, for a pulse, okay? Um, but then you've got this one just around the back here as well that one just there. Now that one there is really important uh, It's your vertebral artery. 
and uh, if you have a look it goes through holes that are in the side of your cervical vertebra so that there, there are uh, vertebral foramen which are um, side um, holes basically and that's where your vertebral artery goes up and that blood supply there uh, that supplies the uh, the uh, main parts of your brain, so the brainstem area. Okay, uh, so we've got uh, those there and there, and then obviously the carotid goes up and, and supplies the brain, and that these these all meet together. Okay, there's something called the circle of Willis. Uh, if you wanted to have a look at uh, that in a bit more detail, so that that's your blood supply. Uh, let's just take off that and add in some of the nervous system. Okay, so then these are your nerves coming out. So we can have a look at the nerve roots here. Okay, so these are all the nerve roots coming out of your, uh, well, all of them. This is the brachial plexus just here. And then you've got um, a cervical plexus as well that um, supplies all the kind of face and, and head and neck and stuff. So these ones here, these lower vertebra, these are the ones that supply uh, the, the muscles in the shoulder and the arm. Okay, so that um, you can see the kind of network of, um uh, nerves coming down there okay so that's your nerve supply and then if i just take that off then we can add some muscles in as well so um we've got all these kind of hyoid muscles around here around the hyoid bone um up into the jaw um these are really deep muscles these ones um the um uh cervicis muscles but they you'd never be able to palpate those then we've got ones that you probably have heard of before so longissimus yeah that's one and then um, semispinalis and spinalis so these are part of your erector spiny group um so those are those are there if we add another layer on we've got this one at the back so semispinalis again uh, then we've got these ones in here okay uh, these ones are your scalenes okay ones at the uh, ones at the front here we've got um thyroid uh, sternothyroid, uh, what's that one? Cervices again. So that that one's um, obviously a bit too too deep to uh, to palpate that one. Here we go. These are the ones that you can usually get to. So scalenes in there and there, uh, and then we'll add another layer on, and another one. There we go. So sternocleidomastoid at the front. So going from the sternum and the clavicle up into the mastoid process. Yeah. So that um, maybe some involvement in these. We've got these muscles here that attach right on the occiput, uh, often involved in headaches, reason why I'm showing you these. Then you've got your uh, big trap um, muscles. So you've got the uh, upper trapezius muscle there. We'll just take a layer off again, uh, zoom out. And then that one there, which is your levator scapular muscle. Okay, so that's just a quick recap of, of the neck region in, in the main kind of musculoskeletal thing. So blood blood supply, nerve supply and then muscle attachments in that in that region okay uh, let's just go back to those okay so that's a quick recap of that so with those in mind bearing those in mind and and this is the kind of thing that i would do so someone comes in with neck pain and i go right okay what's in that area kind of take off imagine taking off the skin and then what and then what's uh, what's underneath so uh, let me just move me out of the way again. So he's presenting today with claim, com, uh, complaining of unilateral neck pain on the right-hand side from the occipital area, so the area at the base of the skull that we were just looking at, uh, on the right-hand side uh, to the cervicodorsal junction, which is the C7-T1 area, okay? And then it radiates across the posterior shoulder. So already thinking about those muscles we've looked at, we're thinking, right, okay, it could be one of those muscles, yeah? J just usual kind of musculoskeletal issues. Uh, it feels like tightness. Uh, his neck feels heavy. There's no sharp pain, uh, but the pain seems to be exacerbated on end range flexion. So when it comes all the way forward, that's when um, that brings some symptoms on. So are they linked? To, is, it, is the pain he's getting down into that posterior shoulder uh, the same as that, that one when he's flexing his head? Um, there's no specific focal dermatomal neurological symptoms. So basically, there's no loss of sensation in certain regions of the arm. So the nerve roots that we just had a look at, they supply the, um, or the sensation, uh, the sensory part. Um, uh, you get sensory feedback into those um, areas uh, fr from, the, uh, from the shoulder or the arm 
into those regions of the neck and then up into the brain. Okay, so um, that but there were no weird sensations in any kind of normal dermatomal pattern. Yeah. Um, the way the dermatomes work around the arm is kind of like a loop. So you've got kind of C4, C5 area down here, comes down into a bit of C5 there, C6 around the thumb, uh, C, uh, C7 around the middle finger, C8, and then T1 here. Okay, so it kind of goes around in a loop like that. Yeah, that that's your dermatome. And that's because when we are an embryo, um, we're like a little sausage with little arms like that. And then, as and then, your nerves are still attached to the skin of the of the hands. Um, but then, as your arms grow, the nerves get pulled along. Okay, so the uh, the nerves will grow at, with your arm. Um, but because of the position of your of your limb buds, so your legs and your arms when you're an embryo, everything gets stretched, and that's why you get that um, the sensation for C7 is now is down here. Um, but it would have been in line with the C7 vertebra when you were like that. Okay, so uh, yeah, just uh, some yeah useful bit of trivia maybe. Uh, okay, let's have a look at this. So he cannot be clear about the odd feelings, a um, bit of mild pins and needles or tingling. And we've covered this a few times. So it's either going to be nerve supply or blood supply. Okay, um, well, usually nerve supply or blood supply. You can get muscle referral as well. So you can get um, somatic referral, so from the uh, uh, mus uh, muscle tissue. You can also get something called sclerotomal pain as well. Now, sclerotomes, I'm going to cover this a bit more on Friday. They're to do with irritation of the joint. Okay. So, uh, the, um, yeah, the joint, if they're, the joint surfaces, if they're irritated, they can refer pain in, in certain areas. Okay. So, it, may, it can be a nerve supply. It can be a blood supply. It can be a muscle fatigue issue or muscle injury problem um, or it could be a, uh, a joint irritation that refers symptoms okay so um, I'll, I'll do a little on a uh, little bit on sclerotomes on Friday okay um, I'll just type it in the chat so you know how it's spelt and then you can have a look as well uh, so there you go so it's a sclerotome if you've never heard of that before um, so he suffered from headaches for 10 years but this year He's had nausea associated with them. Okay, so that, that's a bit of a change. So we're a bit concerned about that. He's uh, had dizziness and vertigo. He's a bad headache, throbbing in nature. Okay, so when something throbs on the kind of pulse, you imagine that that would be linked into some kind of blood supply issue. Okay, um, cool. No worries, Natalie. That's fine. Something for you to have a uh, look at. Uh, so he's vomited several times as well during this episode, uh, and it came on when his neck was in hyperextension. Okay, so that that's a real big clue with this one, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk about it in a sec. Uh, so the onset of everything, I think, um, kind of covered that already. But uh, five weeks ago, the neck pain started. Five months ago, odd tingling started. Six days ago, the headaches and vomiting and vertigo. So something's happening. Are they linked? OK, or are they getting progressively worse or has he got something new? All right. So we need to kind of that's where the sieve comes in handy because we can kind of uh, separate things out and then test things individually. Uh, so it's worsening. Resting in general helps. So knowing what helps is often useful as well, because it would um, uh, if resting's helping, then uh, that would affect the um, it would affect the blood supply because, you know, no, no longer need the uh, the blood to feed the area where, when you're being active and it will also help the muscles and the um uh, the joints um and the ligaments as well so if you're not moving those things uh, th then generally they can kind of settle down uh, if it's neurological though usually it will still ping a little bit um because if you compress a nerve um the symptoms last for a little bit longer than if you just tweak a muscle so uh, usually anyway, OK, so uh, we, we can kind of fit it into into certain patterns. Uh, OK, so worse as the day progresses um, and his history has had moderate uh, degeneration of C5, C6, and he had osteophytic um, uh, spurs there. OK, so have a look at what those are if you've not heard of those before. Uh, big clue again, his father's had a stroke. OK, so uh, is that um, with his lifestyle and um, from previously maybe uh, maybe it's affecting him as well uh, and then yet yeah, vertigo nauseous 
um, diet, lots of fats. Okay, we don't um, doesn't say good fats. Uh, it just says fats. So we're assuming uh, saturated fats there. And then diagnosed with moderate emphysema again. So that that's come back again. So what effect will emphysema have? on his uh, general health okay so what's going to happen to his oxygen supply what's going to happen to his blood um and it, the oxygen levels in his blood if he's got emphysema so th things to think about there in terms of his general health so these are the things that i've kind of uh, come up with and then i've left everything else blank for you to have a think about okay so uh, obviously we'll go through this on on the friday but if you can have a think between now and then so it could be a localized uh, neck joint irritation, so some kind of cervical joint irritation. And previously had a C5, C6 problem. Uh, do his symptoms um, uh, look as if that that has got worse? And if it has got worse, then what could it be? Okay, what, what else might be happening? Um, he could have um, the symptoms of stenosis. Okay, and again, if you've not heard of that before, then have a look at, uh, have a look at that. Uh, so cervical stenosis. Uh, a TIA, so a transient ischemic attack. Um, his father's had a stroke, so maybe he's had a TIA or maybe he's had a stroke. Uh, maybe he has cardiovascular disease. Okay, so again, what, why do we uh, why do we think that? Um, it might just be migraines. Yeah, so he's, he's had headaches. He's feeling nauseous. Uh, yeah, really good. Yeah, cervicogenic headaches. Yeah, so it, it could be just a musculoskeletal just a musculoskeletal headache problem. Yeah, uh, really good. Um, or is there an inner ear or vestibular issue? Because he's had this dizziness and vertigo as well. So something else to, to have a look at. OK, so those are our kind of key areas. Um, if you want to have a look, if you think it's something else as well, um, that's the thing with this. There's there's no right answers. It could be a, a multitude of things. So if you can justify it, then absolutely include it on the list. OK, so. This is your task um, but, uh, between now and Friday. So justify your thought processes and then research possible conditions that it could be. Uh, what investigations could be done? So where would you send them to? Would they be A&E? Would they be to the GP? Would they be to a physio or an osteo or whatever? Um, and with that as well, as so a physio, osteo, sports therapist, it's not about the, uh, the qualification. It's about the person's skill. So if that person is skilled in dealing with people like this, then it doesn't matter what qualification they've got. They're, and uh, they're all e you know, equally as qualified. Um, you need to send them to the person that's going to fit this particular patient. OK, um, something for you just to have a look at. So maybe a bit of a clue with uh, uh, some of the things that might be going on. Uh, but what is Meniere's disease? Meniere's disease okay um, have a look at that have a bit of a uh, um, do a bit of research on that one as well if, if you want to write that one down um, and then pop your thoughts on the Facebook page uh, usual place so the COVID group the at MTE CPD group uh, but again if you don't want to post them then uh, send them through to me and um, I can post them on your behalf or we can just have a chat on the messenger okay so um, that's uh, part two done uh, I'll see you for part three on Friday at six. Uh, so we've got quite a few conditions to go through on Friday. And uh, I'll show you, um, uh, yeah, we'll talk about sclerotomes, definitely. Uh, we'll have a look at that. And uh, some, of the v um, uh, some of the checks for um, about problems with, um, uh, with uh, the, the kind of symptoms that he's getting. OK, so uh, he might, might be get, uh, with the dizziness and the, um, the kind of... Uh, uh, the the nausea, all of those kind of things are possibly pointing towards uh, towards one um, one specific issue. So uh, I'll show you how to do some tests for those uh, for those things as well. And the good thing is you can do those online. So if you have a problem, um, uh, or if it, not you, but if one of your patients has an issue, then uh, you can do these tests online to check them out, and then you can go right. Okay, I think you need to go to the GP. OK, so, uh, yeah, well, wherever we can, we'll try and direct you to stuff that you can do virtually now. OK, cool. So I hope you've uh, hope you found that useful. I will. Uh, I'll see you on Friday at six o'clock usual time. And um, we didn't think it was going to come, um, but we ordered a barbecue. They said it was going to be here in about four weeks time. And we're like, oh, but it arrived today. So uh, if the weather's nice after doing this, I'm going to have a barbecue on Friday. So uh, uh, good. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. Yeah. Um, 
You'll have to let me know your address, mate. No problem. <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah, if um, if you want to, uh, as I said, th we're going to do, this is week eight, so we're going to do weeks nine and ten. Yeah, exactly, John. Yeah, uh, We're going to do weeks nine and ten, and then we're going to call it uh, call it a day for this. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to change the uh, the webinars they're not going to be as frequent but we're go I'm going to do some uh, I'm going to do some anatomy stuff so uh, like drawing on anatomy uh, surface markings of things uh, palpation of shoulders and feet and stuff like that so uh, keep an eye out for those because um, I will still be doing stuff uh, once these are finished uh, depends on how busy we get when uh, when we get back to work so uh, but yeah I'll uh, I'll keep going for uh, for as long as we're off okay guys uh, see you Friday. Take care.